Welcome to the Ad Nauseam Podcast, where classical gourmands everywhere can finally get their fill. Join us for a delectable discussion of Greco-Roman civilization stretching from the Minoans and Mycenaeans through the Renaissance and right down to the present. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here are your hosts, Dr. David Noe and Dr. Jeff Winkle. Welcome, Ad Nauseam listeners, to episode 146 of our little podcast. We are down in the bunker, the Vomitorium South, uh, the basement of the RHB Bookstore and Warehouse. My name is Dr. David C. Noe, here with my good friend and uh, mint sweatered co-host, Ooh. Dr. Jeffrey T. Winkle. How are you, Jeff? I'm doing I'm doing well. Once again, feeling outclassed by your attire. Yes. You got, you got the jacket and tie on and, and such, uh, but I, I, I feel sometimes you do it just to... Just to kind of... Make you feel bad? Exactly. Well, right. as I age, you know, this is more like my spare attire. Oh, really? Say, you know? Oh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. But hey, I uh, I went to the dentist recently. Oh, that, oh, I hate going to the dentist. Yeah. How did that go? Well, um, I woke up this morning and the sun was gone, so I put on some music to start my day. Yes. Then I lost myself in a familiar song. Yes. I closed my eyes. Yeah. And and uh, you went away. I slipped away. Slipped away, yes. Yeah. yeah but then I had terrible tooth pain. <laughs> Terrible tooth Ter- pain. Terrible tooth pain. So I went to the dentist. Okay. And uh, he took a he took a look around and yeah. he saw uh, Marianne walk away. Yes. And I said to the dentist, um, "What's the problem? What do I need?" And he said, "You know what? I think it, I know where this is going, but please go on. It's going to be more than a filling." <laughs> <laughs> oh, I knew it was coming. I still love it. Yeah, yeah that's fantastic. More than a filling. Yeah. <laughs> It's like a crown and maybe some bridge work. More than a pill. That's right. I got to tell you, Jeff. Yeah. I I have a muse. Uh, She's lazy and won't show up on time. Yeah. Last night, I just had this epiphany mm-hmm. that there is a stupid pun there. Yeah. And I'm going to work on it. Right. So I dropped everything and 10 hours later, here we are. I, so I love it. I love it. Exactly. I, right. I, I also love, I love the... Um, I love the gag of reciting song lyrics. Yes, as if that's what you're going through or what I you like just went through, too. and treating it like just like a prose narrative. I like that too. To me, that that can't miss. Why do you think that's so appealing to us? I don't know. It started with me. I remember once I was on an airplane. Yeah. At a time where you you were limited. Were you leaving on an airplane? I was. <laughs> okay. I was leaving on an airplane, but in the days where you were kind of limited to listen to what was on like the little stations. Oh boy. right. But I remember there was a, a British comedy channel. Yes. And there was a guy reciting the lyrics of a hard day's night as okay. if it was serious poetry, and it was hysterical. Right. 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 <laughs> so ever since then, I've loved that. Yes. Yeah. So uh, yeah. you're doing well. I'm uh, doing well. I'm doing fairly well. Yep. And um, we got a shout out today, don't we? We do. Yeah. You want to start this off for sure. us? Sure. He says, uh, Sawete. Ooh, a little bit of Latin. Nice. I am Benjamin Phillips, uh, an MA student in history at Ohio University and a regular listener of the Ad Nauseum podcast. You ever been to uh, the, Ohio, the Ohio University? Um, this is not the Ohio State University. This is just Ohio University. Yes, which is in Athens, Ohio. Yes. And I think the answer to your question is no. Neither have I. All right. No. Okay. I only th- discovered the show about a year ago after being tipped off by my old professor. You know, there's always an old professor behind these things. <laughs> <laughs> Crotchety old dean. Yeah. He says, I have since enjoyed listening to the banter, interviews, and discussions for which the podcast is known. Ooh. Did you know we have a reputation? I didn't, but I, I, this is it. I like it. I like it too. And it has helped me to fill out the nooks and crannies of my classical learning. Excellent. So apparently his classical learning is like an English muffin. It's just filled with kind of nooks and crannies. That's right. And, and, we, and we are the melted butter. We're the, <laughs> the layer of butter of animal fat and the nooks and crannies of his learning. Yes. You want to continue? Yes. He says, on which note, be it mentioned that I obtained a bachelor's in humanities at Boyce College of Louisville, Kentucky. Here I first encountered the depths of the Western tradition and the value of the ancient world. While pursuing a minor in classical education, I also learned and fell in love with the Latin language. Then I came to Athens, and I'm assuming this is Athens, Ohio, Yes, where the specter of specialization loomed before my eyes. That's a little frightening. I it, like the turn of phrase, but the specter of civilization loomed before his eyes? It, it is. A, it's, a, it is a, it's very ominous. That's yes. correct. The initial plan was to study classical reception among the English Puritans, but my supervisor moved to Florida after my first semester and left only enough time to squeeze out a quick paper on Joan o- John Owen's post-war writings. This little corpus includes the Theologumena uh, Panto, Pantobata. Uh, let me help you there. Yes, Panto da Pa. Panto da Pa. Panto da Pa. Theologumena Panto da Pa. All right, which still lacks a decent translation. So yeah. this is interesting because... Is, that, is, this, is this a project of yours? Yes, it's one I'm working on. Oh, well, there you go. And I wonder if he knew that when he sent me this. Oh, I think, he, I think he's... Uh, you I, think he's greasing the skids? I think he might be greasing the skids. He yeah. wants to be the next Ron Henley. 
<laughs> have become a regular on the podcast. Not going to happen, Benjamin. We'll, we'll see. Maybe they can go head to head. Yeah. I don't, also don't know why he would refer to John Owen's corpus as little. Maybe that's uh, facetious. John Owen wrote a massive amount of stuff. Maybe he is being, by saying little, he means massive. I see. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah, pick it up. Okay. Fortunately, OU has two good historians of late antiquity, as well as the most recent translator of Claudian. I have greatly enjoyed studi- studying under their aegis and will be defending my thesis on a Wednesday. Nice. Wait a minute. That's probably What's yesterday. That? Man. Yeah. Wanting to know how Christians first approached the classics. I wound up writing on initial reactions to the breach of the Rhine frontier in 406. Don't you hate when that happens? When my, when my Rhine frontier gets breached. breached, it's the worst. Yes. Yeah. Think Augustine's City of God, but with more poetry. Hmm. Uh, I don't like to be told what to do, frankly. <laughs> I have found them to be sensitive readers and deployers of scripture, each other, and the epic tradition. My wife and daughter will be glad to have me back from their company. But my time among these afflicted Gallo-Romans has been fascinating. You want to finish it off? Sure. After this, I'll be helping to start a classical, classical academy in town. The prospect of teaching Latin, developing faculty, and staying at my local church are all quite exciting, as is the longer commute and further opportunities to listen to your show. Yeah, isn't that nice? That is very nice. I especially like the way that he ended this long autobiographical uh, description with a reference to us. Yes, exactly right. And looking forward forward to an extended commute because he can use the opportunity to listen to the show. Yes, and he says, uh, Waleta, right? That's how you sign off, Waleta Benjamin. So you got nice uh, Latin brackets to the whole message. Absolutely. Nice job, Mr. Phillips. Thank you uh, for listening. Thank you for the shout out. Thanks for keeping the torch lit yes i hope that defeat that defense of your thesis went well and um best uh bona fortuna on the starting of the academy nice i'm sure that he covered himself with glory yesterday awesome yeah and maybe a little bit of chalk (laughs) potential (laughs) so jeff what is on the menu for today Uh, we are back to mr maru and his uh history of classical education you're talking about henri Um, Henri? yes we are talking about henri and so we're back um, okay, we're trying. To, we're going to try to pick up where we left off a few episodes ago, yes. talking about um, Plato's role in all of this. Yes, we just had a plethora, did we not, of special guests on the program? Yeah, and uh, some great guests. So now we're back at Maru mm-hmm. and the history of education in antiquity, specifically how, Plato. How far does Maru take this? Like, what's the timeline? It, it, when the, for the whole thing? Yeah, for the whole book. Where does Let it get to? Let me just check the TOC, as yes. we call it in the business. You yeah, know what I'm yeah. talking about? I know what you're talking about, the okay. table of contents. Nice. So, what does that say? Uh, well, this would be the section number three, mm-hmm. classical education and Rome, and the final chapter, chapter 10, the appearance of Christian schools of the medieval type. That's okay. what's coming up. The monastic school in the East, its limited influence. The monastic school in the West, the Episcopal school, the Presbyterial school, and the beginning of the medieval schools. And then we uh, finish it off with an epilogue and the Lombard invasion. Okay. So, preludes to the Carolingian Renaissance. So, Carolingian Renaissance, that's uh, 800 Charlemagne. So, I guess... End of late antiquity and looking forward to um, Charlemagne. Gotcha. Right. So we've got, uh, chronologically, we've got a ways to we go. we got a ways to go. Did you bring any uh, <laughs> snacks, any huggable portions I, to sustain us on the journey? I'm now regretting that I, that I did not. Yeah. Yes. Right. But um, i got to tell you, in, in kind of reviewing the, the Plato section today, um, I, I realized that I was under the impression that uh, I thought we knew a lot more about kind of the operations of, of Plato's Academy than we actually do. Mm. And how much of, of these ideas of Platonic education uh, might be simply just theoretical right. and did not actually take place. Mm-hmm. I, I found that kind of just, uh, just that detail alone fascinating. Could you say a little bit more about that? Maybe you can tell us what were some of your misconceptions or misconceptions? My, well, well, I guess my misconceptions were, I think I, I made kind of the assumption that Plato's ideas about education were things that indeed were being practiced mm. at that time in the academy and that these were things that that um that he was teaching and his ideals about kind of who would be ta- taught what were things that were at- actually taking place and mm-hmm. I I think I made that assumption um that kind of tied those things together um but from Maru's text uh he kind of points out that we don't really know mm. that a lot of what Plato's ideas about education it's certainly influential on what education becomes may not have actually happened in the way that he was describing them Got in it. the laws and the Gorgias and, and the Republic yes. All right, so uh, kind of along those lines, mm-hmm. um, you know, Maru tells us that uh, the academy was, in some ways, it was developed as as to be kind of be opposed to the sophists. Okay, right? it was not meant to be a commercial enterprise. 
um, but it was more kind of thought to be a, a brotherhood. Mm -hmm. um, and as such, a lot of the language around it seems to be almost like the mystery cults. So okay. Like um, you'll be invited into, initiated into the mysteries mm -hmm. of, of the education. Or the Moose Lodge. Uh, the Moose Lodge. Yeah, right. Or the Elk Lodge. The Elk Lodge or the Masons. The Stone right? Cutters. <laughs> exactly right. Right. Yeah. And so there's, there's you know, talk about the ground being consecrated to the to the muses. Mm -hmm. um, and so... I, I, it's it's all within that context that I I was kind of mystified about a lot of the mystery that surrounds the, well, mm -hmm. what exactly it looked and sounded and felt like. Right. Yeah. So um, do you want to read a quote from Yes, Baruch I would like this? to. Yeah. So this is uh, from page 67. And uh, he says, quote, We have recently begun to obtain some idea of its structure, the it being the academy. The academy was a strongly built institution. It was not a commercial enterprise, but a confraternity or sect and all its members were closely united in the bonds of friendship. There was still an emotional, if not an amorous, link between master and pupil. So this is a reference to a previous chapter on pederasty. Right. Juridically, like the Pythagorean sect, it was a religious association, theosos, a brotherhood dedicated to the muses, and after Plato's death, to the apotheosized Plato. A wise precaution, soothing the susceptibilities of a bigoted democracy ever ready to accuse the philosophers of impiety, as the proceedings against Anaxagoras and Diagoras and Protagoras had shown, not to mention the action taken against Socrates and still to be taken against Aristotle, sometime between 319 and 315, and uh, Th Theophrastus, who hmm. was uh, Aristotle's successor. The cult took the form of festivals, arranged with the utmost care in a series of sacrifices and banquets. Now, would this be like a, I'm um, editorializing here, would yeah. this be like a, like a fall festival? <laughs> Philosophers carving pumpkins? Right. And, <laughs> yeah, I like the thought of that. You think that's right. what it would be? Or, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, like, a, you know, a music festival? What do you think he means by festival? No, it's just bobbing for apples. Okay. Right? <laughs> Uh, in a series of sacrifices and banquets, the Academy was a sanctuary consecrated first to the Muses and then to Plato himself. It was situated in the shade of the sacred wood dedicated to the hero Academos in a lonely and secluded spot in the northern environs of Athens near Colonus. Now, I, I, before we get into this, I can't remember if I asked you this last time, but have you been to that area to where the there's some excavations there there are some excavations i believe i have tried a couple of times actually to find it yeah on foot with not much success it's a bit of a hike it, it is. is i mean it's a ways out of the center you can city. take the metro out there yeah and then wander around which i think i've done a couple times but all of my attempts to visit the academy in athens have yeah. been um unsatisfying Unresolved. Gotcha. Gotcha. Aporetic. Yeah. How yeah. about you? I have not. It's on my list of, of things to, to see. I don't. I don't. It doesn't look like from what I've seen on online that there's a whole lot to see. But mm -hmm. I think I, I would. I would love to visit it just to just simply to be there. Yes. Do you remember the trip we took down to the Piraeus? I do. Yes. Exactly. Walking. Why do you shore? say it that way? Because it was not pleasant, as I remember. Oh, I don't have a terrible memory of that. It was well. The standards of hygiene in the particular. Uh, <laughs> Subway car that you and I were sandwiched into. <laughs> well, that part left yes. more than a little bit to be desired. Okay, now okay, that part of it is coming back to me. I was okay. thinking more kind of uh, walking along the shore and seeing the ships nice. out in the water. That right? was nice. But it yeah. was a sunny Sunday afternoon, if yeah. memory serves. Yes. We also that day visited um, the first uh, cemetery of Athens, right? Where we saw Schliemann's grave. Where we saw Schliemann's grave yes. and lots of other really fascinating tombs. That was, that was fantastic. Mm -hmm. right? And all of it, um, the best part, no students. <laughs> <laughs> I'm you're kidding. gonna you're gonna have to I'm explain kidding. to all of those former students of ours <laughs> no. who are listening to the podcast why were there no students, Jeff? Oh, well, but this was kind of our own free time, right? right? Students were off doing their own thing, but yes. uh, we, we we dealt with them uh, soon enough, right? But to get back to the quote here, yes, um, I, it seems like Maru is suggesting that the kind of the whole religious aspect may have been a kind of cover. Hmm. Right. So, I mean, how, I mean, there's, I mean, lots of questions surround, you know, what did Plato actually believe about right. the gods? You know, what did he accept and, 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 and what did he reject? Yeah. Uh, but Maru seems to suggest is that Plato learned his lesson from Socrates is that mm -hmm. we, at least we have to have kind of the sheen of religiosity or right. else they're going to come calling. That does seem to be the suggestion. I've always taken uh, Plato to be, if not a monotheist, absolutely a henotheist. Yeah. And this is the way that I have explained him to students, right? There's a strong line of almost monotheism in his dialogues. For example, in the Euthyphro, there's a clear attack on the inconsistencies of polytheism, at least as um, popularly conceived by people who read Homer as a, you know, theology textbook. Yeah. Um, 
now maybe you'd say it's more like henotheism, you know, one supreme God right. with lots. I'm not saying this for your benefit. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, one supreme God with lots of subordinates. I think that's the Max Muller interpretation. Okay, yeah. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, German 19th century anthropologist and, and student of uh, religion and mythology. But then students are usually surprised when they find out who is that one supreme God, because you would naturally think it's Zeus. Right. Right. But it's not. It's Apollo. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. If there's any God in the Platonic dialogues that has a kind of strict justice, it's Apollo. Right. Right. Yeah. No, I, it's a really interesting question. I mean, certainly I think that's uh, what you just said explains why Platonic thought uh, merges with early kind of awakening Christian thoughts uh, yes. fairly easily because right. it's, it's adaptable to to monotheistic ideas. But I do think, you know, Plato is hard to pin down. You know, we'll talk about how one of his issues with Homer was that he didn't like how Homer portrayed the gods. Right. You know, it was disrespectful to the to the gods. Yes. So um, so what does that mean? Is is he is he kind of he believed in the traditional gods but kind of saw them in a very different way? Or did, was he he's saying that this all can be kind of lumped together in a kind of pure monotheism is the, uh, they're all kind of represented as the good or the one. Yeah. yeah. I think it, I mean, to give a preliminary answer, I think it's more the latter. Yeah. And I think the proof for that is in the Timaeus, you know, the Timaeus and the laws are the two last dialogues. And mm -hmm. in, in the Timaeus, he has more or less dropped the uh, charade of actual um, interlocutor with Socrates. Right, 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 right. The Elenchus is not there. Socrates is giving long, long speeches. Yeah which are highly programmatic in nature. But if memory serves, um, I didn't read the whole, reread the whole Timaeus before, you know, this, um, this episode. He drops the traditional identifiers for the gods, and he uses terms like the demiurge and the god and so forth. Yeah. So I think he has, you know, he's shed traditional terminology yeah. by that point. Yeah, okay, yeah, I, that, that makes sense to me, yeah. So, um Whatever this was happening mm -hmm. in the Academy, or at least in, in Plato's ideal for or for what he thought it should be, um, it's clear that at some level he thought this was a a, a very important concern for the state. Yes, and, absolutely. And that uh, the ultimate goal of kind of extended education, um, um, you know, kind of going beyond into what we would call like graduate school, was to produce these philosopher kings absolutely. that we see in the in the Republic, and that we spoke of uh, to some extent. Yeah. In the previous episode on right. Mahru, right. the different persons all over the Mediterranean who went out kind of like philosophical missionaries and tried in their various city-states, uh, sometimes ending up in opposition to one another in competition and even war, but tried in their various city-states to put into practice Plato's political program. Yeah. Way yeah. too much alliteration in that phrase. I <laughs> did not intend it. Oh, nicely done. That's yeah. one of my least favorite uh, figures of speech. Yeah. Uh, Okay, Jeff, so as we go on, yeah. I, I noticed that Mahru makes the point, first of all, that this education, state-sponsored, state-organized, at least conceptually, was uh, parallel. Yes. But not co-ed. No. So can you explain the difference? Well, I mean, that I think it's, it's striking that uh, Plato uh, thought that both boys and girls should be educated, but not exactly in the same way. Now, wait a minute. I yeah. thought that all ancient people were, um, you know, what... What's the word I'm looking for? Raging sexist? Yeah, right. chauvinists, <laughs> right. unredeemable chauvinists. Right. Is, is that not true? It, I don't think it is true, hmm. right? It, but, and again, uh, we, uh, we've, we've talked at length in, on other episodes about um, what kind of lenses you apply to the past right. to make these kinds of judgments. But um, I would say, again, from a modern lens, this is kind of unexpectedly uh, progressive. Correct. Someone might say. Women yeah. are educated, men are educated, or yep. boys are educated, girls in it are educated, but not necessarily in the same class. In the same way. Right. Right. So, okay. um, I mean, see, I saw throughout this chapter is, you know, Maru is talking about, uh, I mean, Plato himself seems to kind of wrestle between kind of the ideal of education and also kind of the practical nature. Of mm -hmm. I mean, it's something that, that goes on to this day. Right? Absolutely. What, what is the purpose of education? Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of the things that he, pro that he said that young boys and young girls should go through had a kind of practical function. He's mm -hmm. looking forward to kind of the kinds of roles they would play in the state. Right. And, and I think a lot of that kind of uh, explains why it's parallel. Okay. Yeah. So shall we talk about uh, elementary education in particular? Yeah. I was struck by, you know, two of the things that, that Plato says should be foundational for um, uh, kind of elementary education are gymnastics and music. Okay. Which uh, it struck me. I don't know how, how it was when you were growing up. 
But those two pieces of, I had both of those. I had gym okay. and I had music, but they were also probably the two subjects that were probably the most ridiculed by the kids or the thing taken least seriously. Oh, well, music definitely. Yeah. Uh, and, until fifth grade when people sorted themselves into band, right? Right. Fifth grade, sixth grade, there was the, the band that you sorted into. Right. Um, gymnastics or the gym class, it was what everyone loved the most. But I don't. I don't think there was ridicule. What was your experience? I th- I think, well, in terms of what deep dark elementary secrets are you going to no, reveal th- on the I air? I think it, it was kind of this notion of. Um, well, it was a lot of dodgeball. I yes. Remember that. <laughs> did you play any um, um, hockey with the tennis ball? Yeah. Oh, we did that too, right? Yeah. But I mean, there was always this sense of like, uh, yeah, this is fun to kind of you know get out and, and mess around a little bit, but this isn't education. Hmm. Right? The idea that um, you know you, you, you've heard the old saws like. Um, um, you know those who uh, those who can't do right. teach, and but those who can't teach teach gym. Oh, I've never heard that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's always had kind of that. I think that place of of ridicule and pop culture, yeah. and it certainly had kind of bled down to my experience. But huh. and then then uh, yeah, for me of, it was just an escape from the doldra oh, of yeah. the classroom. I, I get that too. You can go run around, chase each other, and hit each other with jump ropes right. and things right. for an hour. <laughs> you know the jump rope with a little plastic sleeve on it yes it's like a really hard straw (laughs) exactly whip that thing around oh that was painful (laughs) right so but and then yes exactly music education before we got into band and i would even say even after we got into band, it was it just seemed so kind of rinky dink you played the blocks you played the triangle (laughs) exactly right right the recorder right let's uh and then you know trying to get third graders to appreciate Bach. Yeah. Right? It's, it's not going to happen. I, that, I was never exposed to Bach in third grade. Oh. Okay. I think I could have gone for that. Right. To my knowledge, the music instructor never played Bach uh, mm. for us. It was more like, um, I don't know, American folk songs. Oh, okay. All Which, right. Johnny Appleseed kind of stuff. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Right. So I just, I just, that just struck me as kind of for, you know, in platonic thought, mm-hmm. the pillars of early education were things that when I was growing up, were certainly not, not I did pillars. not digest them as as pillars to my yeah. education right huh yeah. you want to read the quote yeah. from uh page 70 here about gymnastics a sound body but it, it's not centered around the agon or the competitive spirit yes so Marie writes says, as regards gymnastics Plato spoke out violently against the competitive spirit which as I have remarked was already wreaking havoc on sport in his day he aimed at restoring it to its original purpose as a preparation for war and for this reason, the branch of pure athletics in which he was chiefly interested was wrestling, hmm. the immediate preparation for combat. So again, it's gymnastics as in a way that would serve the state, not competition for its own sake. Yeah. So what would Plato think about uh, March Madness? I think he would think it's absolutely ridiculous. Speak out violently against the competitive spirit. Right. Unless you're bouncing rubber balls against Sparta, <laughs> right? <laughs> then what's the point of this? So right. it could it could be dodgeball if, if the ball, uh, when it arrives, detonates. Yes, <laughs> Or right. something like that. Right, right, right. No, I mean, I have Grenade to... Grenade practice. Right, yeah. I mean, I have to think... Uh, if you think about, okay, what what sports were being were um, were being uh, played and, and competed sure. in, there were certainly things that, that... Oh, they tracked directly to... To warfare. Absolutely, right? most he, of them. But he, right. uh, he, he didn't like that the focus was on maybe kind of intra-Athenian competition right. rather than thinking about what this is actually for. Okay. I so, I mean, to parody poor Plato, yes. just for uh, a moment, he would look at like the, the men's sprint at the Olympics mm-hmm. and he would say, yeah, they're really fast, but where's the killing? Where's the killing? <laughs> Exactly. I think he would, he would, uh, you know, if they had had Winter Olympics, right. he would have loved the biathlon, skiing and shooting. Yes. Now we're talking, right? <laughs> but uh, what's our least favorite one in the summer? Uh, what, what have we talked about Rhythmic this? Rhythmic gymnastics. Oh, exactly. Right. Or anything involving a trampoline. Yeah. <laughs> he wouldn't go for that. No, he would not. Right. Okay. All right. Let me pick this up. He says, of course, the list of games that together made up physical education included other sports. There were the usual foot races, sprinting, and so on. But Plato also introduced fencing and heavy and light infantry fights, and generally speaking, insisted on the exercise of being a military nature, intended for women as well as men. For the Botanic City had women soldiers, archery, throwing the javelins, slinging, marching, maneuvers, camping. So, I mean, that, I mean, it does not seem to be... Camping is a military <laughs> activity? Glamping. Okay. <laughs> but the, that, that women were doing this as well. Um, I, this, I, this is fascinating. Uh, to this standard training... He added the aristocratic sport of riding, compulsory for the girls, too, and its normal accompaniment, hunting. Right. All these being archaic features deriving immediately from the most ancient aristocratic tradition. But there was one point that forecast the Hellenistic institutions of the future. 
All this pre-military training is to be given in gymnasiums, in public stadiums, and riding schools under the direction of professional instructors paid by the state. Hmm. Sounds hmm. rather totalitarian, it does, does it not? Oh, he's got that. He's got that. He's got that muscle that he flexes. Yes. Yes. Well, and I think it's important to remember that um, the republic on which much of this description is based, mm -hmm. right, has often been criticized uh, not as a utopia but as a communistic nightmare. Yes, exactly. <laughs> now, whether or not that's true depends in large part on whether you think that uh, Plato is actually seeking to legislate for a real city. Yes. Or if he is describing uh, a very complicated metaphor for the ordering of the soul. Exactly. Exactly right. And that, I mean, uh, we don't really have an answer to that mm -hmm. question. Right. So, um, so part of this, uh, and this seems a natural extension, he talks, uh, uh, Murrow talks about how um, hygiene and diet mm -hmm. were included in this. This is your um, nutrition class. Yes. Yep. Did you have one of those I in did. Uh, elementary school or I, high school? I did. I don't remember much about it, but I do remember going to it. Taught yeah. you how to brush your teeth. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, don't, yeah. Don't floss behind your ears, things like that. <laughs> right, right, right. You have memories of those classes or not really? I, I remember that I went to them, but not much of the, of the lessons um, where where was that. your mind during? I mean, where did it want to go? Where did it want to be? I was always comic kind of, books or yeah, yeah, comic books are kind of just playing music in my head and listening to that. Right, right. <laughs> a little dancing monkey banging some <laughs> yeah. symbols together yeah. in your head. Exactly right. I was always good at letting my mind wander yeah. off. Right, yeah, <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, it seems that you know Plato's idea was to have um, his education be in tune with the, the advances in medicine mm -hmm. of the day and, and, and incorporating that, and then. And so also quite, music. Quite progressive yeah. on the whole, yes. you might say. Absolutely, right. So, I mean, it, it strikes me as, as so much of what we're talking about um, is, is stuff that we recognize in our own education, mm -hmm. right? This, this stuff becomes embedded, um, but without maybe the totalitarian right. hammer coming down. Right. right. Well, we talk about, you know, the, the well-rounded child. Mm -hmm. I guess maybe not in the context of obesity troubles, but... <laughs> <laughs> a child shouldn't just be a really, you know, in, intelligent person who can do lots of mathematics, but they should also have, you know, the all-American uh, three-letter athlete. Yes. And so forth. Yes, exactly. Yeah, sound mind and a sound body. Mm -hmm. Right. To quote yeah. Juvenal. Yes. So does this also anticipate or tap into the music of the spheres notion? Well, I think that I mean I was also struck by the um, the, the very important. Uh, place that that music played and it, it it did i mean maru suggests that it has kind of this two-sidedness is that there's something about um plato's idea of music is that mu music done well is inherently moral right and being and being a good musician and being a good singer will make you a more moral person huh. uh, but at the same time he's also thinking well we have lots of these festivals and and processions in this in the state that need accompaniment and they need choreographers and they need dancers. And so right. what better place to prep them for this? So again, it's that ideal mixed with the practical. So do you think there's anything to the platonic notion that um, music is inherently moral? I do. I, I mean... I'm I, surprised. I, but tell me more. No, I think... Uh, I think... Well, it can taps into is... Um, I will often... Uh, if I get into like a theological discussion to people and... and we start getting around to kind of questions of the, the, like the proof of God's existence. Okay. For me personally, um, the way that I can be moved uh, by music in a way that I cannot explain, mm. I will often point to as, as kind of a, a personal proof for God. I did not know this about you. Yes, absolutely. So I think so music for me has, has always been at its best a, a, a mystical experience. Mm. You know, it, I mean, not, not all... Um, not all music, of course, does that. Right. But I think music at its best, its most powerful, can tap into something. I love that idea of the music of the spheres, you yeah. know, whatever that might be. Huh. So that, that music can kind of transport you to something transcendent. Yeah. 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 Like, is it the great Australian uh, rock band? Which, what one? Tears for Spheres. <laughs> Aren't they from Australia? I think they were English. Oh, they're English. I'm yeah. thinking of In Excess. Yes, that's right, right, right. Very similar though, right? Yeah, same era. Yeah, huh. exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, you're in good company with um, the late Reginald Foster. Uh, did he have similar notions? Yes, he said that um, if, uh, I heard him say this directly and personally, that if Haydn and Cicero were not in heaven, he wasn't going. Oh, wow. So wow. Haydn, you know, was the epitome of um, musical expression of divine genius yeah. for him. Yeah, that's excellent. When did you hear 
Foster. I didn't know uh, you were... this would have been 2012. I think he was at the University of Michigan. Oh, okay. I think it was the fall of 2012. It was. He was just got. What was he talking he, about? He was leading. A, he was leading a um, workshop, and I, I yeah. got to go hear him. Interesting, so. man. Mm-hmm. That's fantastic. Yep. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I think that it, it makes me kind of re- regret the the musical education that I had, or maybe better, the the fact that I didn't take it seriously. Yes. Right. And so it was. I. Um, and you know now in hindsight as a as an adult and and recognizing how essential music is to my life in right. so many ways it, it makes me think oh th- it makes sense that 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 Plato would kind of put it as a centerpiece definitely now that you're nearly a senior citizen yeah I have no doubt do you think that <laughs> uh, music will um, continue to play such a large role or maybe increase in scope within your life if anything increase yeah yes interesting in, without a doubt yep. So on page uh, 72, mm-hmm. next, we're going to see Plato interacting with Homer quite a bit. Right. So uh, can I read that quote and then we can talk about it? Yeah, let me just set this up. So okay. This comes from a section in Murrow where he talks about how kind of the study of music kind of gives way to what might, we might call the study of literature. But right. if, you're talking about, if you're talking about epic poetry, that it's a fine line. Well, last week, remember, with the, with the wonderful Stanley Lombardo, all ancient literature was meant to be performed. performed yes. Often with musical accompaniment. Exactly. Uh, for Stan, it was drums. It was drums, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right, right, yes. Uh, yeah, so please read this quote. Okay. Plato condemned the poets because their myths were lies, giving a false picture of the gods and heroes, and one that was unworthy of their perfection. The poet's art, being a product of illusion, was pernicious because it was inconsistent with truth to which all education should be subordinated, and because it distracted the mind from its proper end, the attainment of rational knowledge. By his vigorous contrast between philosophy and poetry, and by breaking with the settled tradition that Homer was the basis of all education, Plato put the Greek soul in a dilemma. Should education remain fundamentally artistic and poetical, or become scientific? Every educator since has had to face this problem, and it has never received any final solution our own education still being divided between the opposing claims of science and the arts. Yes. Now, remind me, when, when, when did Maru publish this book? It was 1948, right after the end of the war. Right. So here we are, um, 75 plus years on. Yes. And um, I would still, this is, is still kind of the, the argument that goes round and round and oh, round. Oh, definitely. And I certainly... But it's, it's a little sloppier, if I can say. Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, for example, mathematics is a liberal art. Yeah. And it was central to Plato's development of the person as a whole. Yes. Mathematics generally today, so far as I know, is seen as entirely a technical skill. Yes. Yes. Not by professional mathematicians. Some of the professional mathematicians I have uh, been blessed to know could argue, I mean, I know one now, could argue very uh, capably that mathematics is about the development of the imagination. Hmm. And so every time I meet a mathematician, a professional... I ask if they would answer some um, questions of arithmetic. Yes. Because I want to know, if you're a great math mind, can you also do times tables quickly and things like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just kind of the game I play. (laughs) And guess what I find? What do you find? Some of them can't. Wow. And they're quick to say, well, that's arithmetic. Uh, I I don't think about that. I don't need to do that. I'm studying topology or... You know, things I can't even pronounce, yeah. which are purely abstract, and they find them beautiful in that way. Yes. But a, but mathematics is not like glorified accounting, right? which is what I think is often conceived of. Right, exactly. I, that, I mean, that is, I, I was, math was never my thing. You know, mm. it, 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 Despite loving music. I, well, I don't think, I don't think of music as math, right? And it's actually... And despite loving language. Right. Um, I don't think of language as math either, right? No. Um, but they are. <laughs> all, all three of them are languages. To some, to some level, but I mean, my least, my least favorite kind of music is music that's mathematically precise, ah. right? I find that so soulless and boring. Mm. But at the same time, I can't even wrap my head around... Um, like theoretical mathematics, mm-hmm. like that. I, I I know what those two words mean, but right. but together I have no idea of what that even. I, my mind can't even conceive of what that might be. Mm. So I'm drawn to that idea of of kind of mathematics as as imagination, right? Of kind of of uh, a, a limitlessness right. rather than saying you are you are you are limited by what these rub- numbers represent, right? But I don't know what that is. I think Plato would say in response that this is just a matter of training because you're a smart guy, Jeff. You can do all kinds of other abstract and complicated things. So you were just not taught properly. I suppose. About the specific beauties of 
uh, the most pure kind of knowledge, right? I, I suppose, yes. Because it's the manipulation of things no one has ever seen. Yeah, 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 yeah. No yeah. one's ever seen 47. Right. You know, no one's ever seen the square root of some enormous number, 1,000. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, but it exists in yes. some sense. Yes, exactly. So in that sense, it's the purest, most rational kind of thinking. Yeah. And you're capable of it. Uh, perhaps. I think my, my problem is I never, I never came to love it. Yeah. Right. And I, I have a, a very difficult time forcing myself things to do that I'm just not naturally right. drawn to. And so, so when they sent you to math class, where did your mind go? Oh, I, I, I just, I, I mean, I gutted it out. I remember um, the, the one class in all of high school that I really struggled with was algebra. Hmm. And I just, my mind could not grasp it. I did, it didn't help that I didn't have a great teacher. Yeah. But um, I remember just kind of just, Forcing myself, killing myself, just to 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 get a decent grade in that, and then being and and, and convincing myself I was happy enough with hmm. that. But I never came to, to love it. I mean, what was your experience with math? It, well, I was just going to say, um, I have one really uh, interesting memory from algebra class. I think, but I loved math, um, mm -hmm. and for a while had some minor ability, mostly because my particular school, a very small public high school didn't teach hardly any languages, literature, and things like that. Oh, okay. So the only way to get any kind of intellectual satisfaction was to pursue math and science. Yeah. So I did, and I enjoyed it. But I was in Algebra 2 or something, and I'm working on a problem, and I got my pencil, and I'm developing a little rhythm, you yeah. know, of moving along in terms of the sounds that the pencil is making, and I'm really pleased as I'm making the marks and so forth, and the, the guy that's sitting to me, sitting next to me at the table, he can hear kind of the percussion instrument that I was trying to make with my pencil. He yeah. says, um, you're really having a good time, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you can just tell from the sound of your pencil That's that right. you were enjoying this. I was. Because <laughs> I had figured out a way to make all the marks, yeah. but in a kind of actual percussive rhythm. Yes. You've done that before, haven't you? I have, yeah. right. So, and, but, so you, you turned the math into music. I tried. Yeah. yeah. That's so great. That, that was fun. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. I think after... You know, when you're in eighth grade, ninth grade, the last thing you want to do is stand out yeah. for something like that. Yes. So I think after he said that, I stopped doing it. I see. Man, <laughs> man, it's amazing how just kind of one thing like that. Right. right one little phrase, some yes. offhanded remark, uh, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of offhanded remarks, yes. it's time for the ads. This episode of Odd Nauseam is brought to you by Ratio Coffee. Ratio Coffee found at ratiocoffee.com. You can find their wonderful products, um, and I'm just going to jump right to it. Yes. I'm really excited about this this uh, this ratio four that's coming right. out. We've talked at length about the six and the eight, yes, um, but they've got this they've got this wonderful machine coming out, um, and uh, they advertise it as the first affordable and beautiful half batch pour over coffee machine. Um, the four is their smallest brewer yet, an agile, sleek machine that puts out between five and twenty ounces of coffee per batch, enough for one to two reasonably sized cups or one big travel mug. Yes. I would just like to point out that when it says between 5 and 20 ounces of coffee per batch, yes. I'm pretty sure that you can adjust it to the amount you want. Yes. It's not like you it's have to guess, guess each time. <laughs> What's it going to be? Right. Seven. I got seven. You have to have a number of different containers ready. Right. <laughs> No, no, no. <laughs> yes. So it brews with a bloom cycle, mm -hmm. just like the eight and six, in about four minutes or less. Yes. A removable water tank can be positioned on the left, the right, or behind. Small enough to fit on any countertop. It's just 11 and a half inches tall by seven and a half inches wide. That's about like a sheet of paper that I'm holding right here. It's very, yeah, mm -hmm. very small. It built to last and backed by a five-year warranty. A five-year warranty. Have Fantastic. you bought anything recently with a five-year warranty? No, you always have to pay extra if you That's want right. the, the warranty. That's right. right. Not yeah. even a vehicle comes with a warranty like that. Right, right. So, yeah, I'm excited about this. Um, and so um, and those maybe of our listeners who've been listening to our ads about ratio and say, I would love to have one, but it's kind of, it's, it's beyond the my... eight's a little bit out of my reach. Yep. And the four, I think, might be in that sweet spot. Absolutely. And uh, from what I can tell, uh, we're going to have to wait a little bit longer. We're looking at September or October, okay. perhaps. All right. But hey, that gives us a lot more time to talk about to it. talk about it and build it up. That's yep. correct. So let's say you want to get the eight, you want to get the six, you want to get in line for the four. Mm -hmm. Jeff, what should the listener do? They should go to ratiocoffee.com, find the the, uh, the product that you want, um, uh, click on uh, the little grocery basket, and you want to type in this uh, code, which would be ANCO2D. Right, and that D stands for, is it delicious? That's mean, that's, I was going to say delicious. Yeah. yeah, it stands for delicious probably. Yeah. So AN, as an ad nauseum, CO Coffee 2 D. Yes, and that will get you 15% off your entire order. Check it out. 
This episode is also brought to you by the good folks at Hackett Publishing. Jeff Hackett has uh, offices where? Uh, in Indianapolis, Indiana, and Cambridge, Massachusetts. And what kind of books do they sell? All kinds of different books, right? Uh, I mean, our main attraction, of course, is their their massive um, uh, a selection of classics. Mm-hmm. But they have they have uh, stuff from all over uh, the, the the various subjects of academia. That's correct. Do yep. you like their covers? I love their covers. Right? Do you find them affordable? I do find them affordable. Right? Would you say it's a good? Do you, do you feel like these questions are leading? Yes, a little bit. Do but... you uh, <laughs> think it's a good way to build up inexpensively an impressive library of classical authors? Without a doubt. Okay. Yes. Right. And you can read great translators like uh, Stan Lombardo, who mm-hmm. just we we interviewed in our previous. Uh, episode. Yes, he's yeah. translated the Iliad, the Odyssey, Ovid's Metamorphoses. Funny, great stuff. I love the way he described Ovid. Uh, Ovid is the poet at play. Yes, exactly. That nailed it, I would say. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. So listeners, hey, if you want to to, to dip into this this um, this vast pool, uh, go to hackettpublishing.com, H-A-C-K-E-T-T publishing.com, search through their vast catalog, and you will be astounded by how affordable this stuff is, mm-hmm. especially if you are a student and you're looking at things uh, like textbooks, um, the, uh, this is the best place to go. Yes, and I'd just like to point out that when we first conceived this podcast and we went to these folks and we said, hey, we know we've done a couple episodes, we've got 1,000 downloads or so. This was the fall of 2020. Mm-hmm. Would you like to be a sponsor? They took a risk, took a flyer on a couple of chuckleheads they and did. said, yes, we want to uh, help people take in the classics and keep them down. Sign us up. Right, right. And have been with us ever since. Ever since, right. So we are really thankful. Right. And um, listener, by by uh, uh, getting these texts, by using these coupon codes, you really you help the podcast, you keep this going on. And, but, and you're going to help yourself too because... Um, uh, to have these these volumes on your shelf. That's right. And mm-hmm. you definitely don't want to traffic with one of their competitors. Oh, no. Do we have a new one in the bunch? Well, one mm-hmm. of their competitors that also um, approached and wanted to sponsor us. Yes. This would be Stack It Publishing. Oh, Stack It Publishing. Yeah, right. exclusively books on Jenga. <laughs> That's it. That's their whole. Do you remember that <laughs> that game with okay. the uh, right? You, you pull out the little piece of wood. You try to keep it from falling. That's right. correct. So their their entire catalog. Their entire catalog is Jenga based books. Jenga themed. Right. right. Exactly. Oh, that's how to, terrible. How to stack it? Part one: stacking for dummies. Things like that. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. S t a c k e t t. Stack it publishing. That's not where you want to go. No. 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 But to go to hack it publishing.com yes, much better right and what will they get when they enter the coupon code if, Jeff? if they enter the coupon code an2024 that's an ad nauseum plus the current year that will get you two amazing things 20 percent off your entire order and free shipping check it out all right jeff as we get back into it uh, you have labeled this part of our show notes today math exclamation point oh boy <laughs> right exclamation point right it's, it was just, it was uh it's just a little bit of sarcasm yes. re- reflecting on my own experience right in, in math i've never felt confident in math can i make a and, request please in the future when you uh when you help write the script can you keep the emotional outbursts to a minimum i i, I will I, I will try okay exactly right so, all right but uh so take us into this part right so um so for math uh, uh plato suggests in his writings that math was in some ways kind of the ideal uh, philosophical subject. It has uh, kind of aims at, um, at exact truth yes. in a way that literature or you know, uh, gymnastics couldn't, uh, couldn't get you. And so it's, um, he, he's talking about math uh, in, in, you know, in the context of his famous allegory of the cave. Mm-hmm. Um, it's mathematics as, uh, is the way that you can emerge from the cave and stand under the, kind of the philosophical sun of, of pure goodness. So we use the math to get out of the cave? We do. To see reality as it is? Right, exactly. Huh. Yeah. So maybe it's math that teaches us that there is something as objective truth. Yes, yeah, I, interesting. I, I think so. I think that's what, what Plato is, is after, and I think that's why he, he, he places it at um, at kind of the top of the heap, you have mm. to you have to go through all these levels of math. You have to master math before you can even begin the, the kind of the contemplation of of pure truth. Right. right. So you're not necessarily going to be a, a literature master, right, or a history master, or even a stair master, <laughs> but a math master. A math master. So yep. was this any part of your own education? Can you remember being in seventh grade pre-algebra? Mm-hmm. Or doing your times tables in fifth grade, yes. you know, did you race with the other kids? Did they ever have races? We did. I loved math because of its competitive nature. You liked that part of I it. I did. Who right. could get to the answer fastest? <laughs> I liked that a lot. Really? That yeah. just stressed me out. Oh, really? Yeah, exactly. You were the kid I always beat. 
I would right. walk past you on the way up to the front to get the, you know, the little paper certificate that yeah. said. I was the kid who was annoyed by your rhythmic tapping of your pencil. <laughs> yes. Did anyone ever explain, Jeff, yes. you should enjoy this because mathematics is in some ways tapping into the most objective and pure reality that'll blow your mind? Of course not. Okay. Right. And so do, I didn't think so. Do you think that would have helped yes. your appreciation? Right. You know, when I, when I, I think one of the things that was, I mean, this is not just math, but one of the things that was missing in my own education was when I went into these classes, there was never any kind of justification yeah. from the teacher of why we're doing this. Or so, discussion of ends and purposes. Exactly. Right. So, and this is why I'm, you know, as a teacher of the humanities, uh, I, it can, I think it behooves me to kind of give a, a constant defense of the humanities. Yes. Uh, just kind of given the, the state of, uh, of the culture we're in. But I think that's important is, is in, uh, at the beginning of, of a course to say, you're all in here, you all signed up this, and this is why we're here. Yes. I never got that. No, I didn't. I don't think I ever did either until college. So I have I have uh, a story and a potential observation. Okay. If I may. Please. First of all, the observation is that when someone is trying to teach me how to play a game, probably my pet peeve is when they explain one rule. Mm -hmm. That's good. Then they start discussing strategy. Mm. When they haven't... Does this ever happen to you? Oh, yes. They yeah. haven't laid out all the rules yet, right. and they're already talking because they're so excited about the game. Yeah. And they're saying, well, you don't want to do this, actually, because that's really not in your interest. You really want to do this because this will help you beat people. And Okay, that's great, but I don't even know what to do with the cards yet. <laughs> right, right. Could you tell me, do I pass to the left or to the right? Yes. Of course, in the Midwest, in Michigan, we have this game, Euchre, mm -hmm. right? You've played Euchre before. Yes, I hate it. Yeah, I figured you did. <laughs> yes. I used to like it a lot. I don't care for it so much anymore. But this always happens in Euchre. People are explaining, turn the bower down, don't pick up the bower. <laughs> and my you know, prior question is, what's a bower? <laughs> right. <laughs> don't, don't explain strategy. So I think that's analogous mm. to the way that some of these subjects are taught. Yes. They're okay. telling you how to manipulate it. But nothing about the purpose of the manipulation. Right. Exactly. Why, why would I want to do this? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Polynomial. Right. Right. Yeah. It was just kind of this assumption that this is the courses that you take and they are important because this is, these are the courses that you take. Exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah. And now the story. That yes. Was, oh, yeah. Yeah. The yeah. observation. Yep. Yep. Um, it was undergrad philosophy class at Calvin Nay College. Yes. Now University. And John Hare, my philosophy professor, said, you've never seen a circle. Mm -hmm. so wait a minute. There's Come, something crazy going on. I've here. seen lots of circles, exactly. sir. What did John Hare have for lunch? Yeah. <laughs> I've never seen a circle. He said, No, no. What what is the geometrical definition of a circle? It's a series of points, all of which are equidistant from another point. Yes. Right? Or or it's a line, all of whose points are equidistant from another point. Okay. So I think, okay, there's I can see a point in my mind. Now there's a line in my mind, right? And if you set them next to each other, the ends of that line are going to be farther from the point than the center points of that line. You with me? Yeah. Okay. But a circle solves that problem because all the points on the line are equidistant from the other point. Yes. So then I said, so why haven't I seen one? He said, well, I'll draw a circle. Now what do you notice? The line has width. And a point, by definition, has no width. Mm. It's, a, it's a point. Yes. It doesn't have any dimension. Therefore, you've never seen a circle. This is part of his lecture on Platonic mathematics. Ah. The things like the triangle and the circle and so forth. If you try to reproduce them in the real world, you inevitably ruin the definition. Yes. Because it's impossible to represent them visually. Or I suppose you've never heard a circle or smelled a circle, right? Right, right. It's just checking. Yeah, 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 yeah. Tasted a circle. No, no, yeah, exactly. So the other senses are equally incapable of representing geometrical truths therefore it exists only in the mind right and that so, that was a moment of epiphany once again right so the, i mean this is kind of this is plato's forms right there is the right there's the ideal perfect uh, form of the circle but we've never encountered that and there's an ideal perfect form of every other thing yes that has reality exactly and we see through a glass darkly correct yes but if your fifth grade teacher had explained a circle in that way would it have made a difference i think so I mean, okay. I, I think that that kind of that um, that very kind of bold, seemingly kind of impossible right. uh, suggestion Paradox. would have gotten my attention. Right. What was your right. fifth grade teacher's name? Uh, Randy Hart was his name. Okay. Yes. Wait a minute, Mr. Hart. I've seen <laughs> lots of circles. Right. That's yeah. what you would have said. Exactly. Come on. Right. Right. Yeah. That maybe that may, would have made a difference. Mm. Right. 
Uh, but let me read a quote here from Maru talking about uh, Plato and his math. On page 75, he writes, Rising above all utilitarian considerations, Plato assigned to mathematics a role which was above all propideutic. Its purpose was not to store the memory with useful knowledge, but to create a well-developed head, that is, a mind capable of receiving intelligible truth, in a way that in geometry an arc is said to be capable of having a given angle formed upon it. It is impossible to overestimate the immense historical importance of this doctrine, which marks the decisive step in the history of education, for Plato here introduces nothing less than the actual theory, and indeed the specific syllabus, of what can only be called secondary education. Interesting. Yeah. So he was, um, he, uh, he was more interested, it seems, in, well, I don't know quite how to describe this. So it, math is, he liked the exactness of it. Yes. Right? And so it was... Oh, the stability of the, it. The stability of it. Um, but he also saw it as a way of, of kind of engaging with the theory of mathematics right. as uh, to develop the mind. Right. And to kind of maybe, you know, to, to till the soil mm-hmm. in which bigger things can be grown. Nicely put. Okay. I got nothing to add to all that. All right, all right, good. All right. I got nothing to add to that. All right. To go on, Plato yeah. ultimately favored theoretical mathematics, use math to understand astronomy, the movement of the planets, not necessarily for the sake of understanding and gaining knowledge about the world or universe. So in other words, mathematics is not a means to being an architect. Right. Although it is that, it's not only that. Yes. But to pursue the calculations used by the demiurge itself. Right. So the math, oh, math is the language or the calculations of God. That's correct. Yeah. So I read a very fascinating book on this subject um, by a person that I don't think is a theist, a British um, astronomer named Martin Rees mm-hmm. called Just Six Numbers. Uh, I read this maybe 20 years ago. Okay. It's about the fine tuning of the universe and the six uh, constants that are necessary for um, the universe itself to exist and how extreme is the fine tuning of these six numbers. Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, if it's off by like one, one decimal place in a, a, a number too large for me to pronounce. Yeah. Nothing exists. That's incredible. And so this is, I don't think the man is a theist maybe, but this is one of those arguments that Plato would have loved. Yes, yeah, absolutely. He could really sink his teeth into Right, that. right, right. Exactly. And by the way, if any of our listeners are interested in that sort of thing, I mean, the mathematics in it was beyond me, mm-hmm. frankly, but I could still get it because the guy wrote well. I suggest you read that book, Just Six Numbers. It's That's, fascinating. That does sound really, really interesting. Yeah. Right. But what about the practical aspect of mathematics? Well, I think you know, Plato certainly said that you know, everyone, um, boys and girls, men and women, should, should be trained in math. And there was a place for uh, you know, the practical notions of math of, of doing sums and you know, going to the market or whatever. But uh, um, I think Plato was ideally was looking for um, his upper level students uh, an aptitude to kind of grapple with the higher mathematics because he, he saw that as the supreme foundation for kind of the, the highest of philosophical pursuits. Okay. Yeah. I can see that. So, Jeff, we're on the downslope here. Yes. You might say we're about to get on our ziffy whompers and uh, <laughs> take them back to the shed for storage. Yes. Uh, do we want to say something about the sophists and uh, how they differed from Plato in terms of, you know, the accessibility of education? Yeah, I think that, um, so the notion the, the sophists would take anybody who would come. And if you had enough you know, drachma in your pocket, you know, right. you know, come on in, we'll, we'll teach you. First come, first served kind of thing? Yes, and I think Plato saw that, well, no, education at some level is for everybody, but he was also very interested in aptitude. Yeah. And not everybody is going to make it to the upper levels. In fact, very few people. Uh, a, a select elite few would make it to the highest levels. So what do you think of that idea? Do you think that that could ever be reinstituted in a, you know, a, a state like the state of Michigan or in a political state like the United States as a whole? And if so, ought it be? Well, I, I think to some degree that does exist. If you, mm-hmm. if, if you think about, um, I, mean, I think these notions are kind of are, are crumbling, but the idea of the number of people who could um, make it into or get a a full ride in a um, uh, particle theory PhD program at MIT. Right. That's a very short list. So yeah. I mean, maybe that's that's the corollary. I mean, I do think this. I think Plato would would have he would have um, flinched at the idea that college is for everybody, and that's certainly kind of the idea that's out there right now. Mm-hmm. I think he would say, well, yes. I mean, elementary and secondary education, maybe up until you're you know 17 or 18. I think he would have said, okay, you know, high school, I get it. But this idea that everyone should go on to college, I think Plato would have said no. Mm-hmm. I think that's where I think he parts with kind of a modern sentiment. Okay. Yeah. 
I mean, is that your sense? Or I mean, yes, if, I think that's right. But I was asking more about what you think. Oh, I see. Should there, should there be a, a basic um, test of literacy and numeracy, and should people be compelled past that to continue learning? From my experience, not you know, not to prejudice your answer, mm -hmm. um, I went to high school with so many people who had no interest in it whatsoever. Yeah, and for them, it was a kind of torture. Sure, my own interest was greatly diminished by some of the ways that it was taught but i'm pretty sure had i but been taught more of the things i enjoyed as i was in college mm -hmm. i would have consumed it voraciously yeah, yeah yeah but that wasn't everyone's experience right right um no i i'm kind of i think i'm, I'm with you in I, that's the uh, i'm in that same boat okay i think when i went to high school too i i would i see the the probably a, a solid a solid majority of two-thirds mm -hmm. of students were, were those that i can't wait to get out of here and i'm only here because the law says I have to yeah. be here. Yeah. So this is the you know the the famous maxim: education is wasted on the young. Right. That's where that came from. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So what's the solution to that? I, I honestly I have no idea. Hmm. I don't know. I mean I think my my eyes have have, have been open to different um, ideas about education teaching at a community college yes. over the last seven to eight years. And and you'd say in a good way. In, right? in a very good way. I become I've, more broad. Yes, and I, I've come to a, a great appreciation of of kind of the more kind of practical and right. you know, directed elements in education. I really like that the school I teach at now says, that, okay, you're going to get your welding certificate. We still want you to take a, a class in literature. Yeah. Right. And so the, I think that recognizes that you're going for something very pointed, very practical. Um, and you may not, you may kind of fight against it, but we still think you being kind mm. of, you know, having a well-rounded education, it should still be part of the, even a program like that. Right. Yeah. Okay. So Plato divide. Thanks for that. Plato yep. divided up the stages of education. Ages three to six was uh, kindergarten. Kind, yeah, so his, to speak. His yep. preferred German term. Yes. <laughs> Ages six through ten would be primary. Mm -hmm. Ten to seventeen or eighteen, secondary. Yes, exactly. And, and what were the consecutive curricula according to Mahru during it's, those times? So once you kind of reach age ten and you were in that secondary, uh, you would there was a progression. You would start with literature and you would progress to music and then you would we would end up with mathematics. Okay. And so I, again, mathematics on the top of the heap. As I we see. Were talking. Yep. And then eighteen to twenty, mandatory military service. Yes. Right. Like South Korea. Like South Korea. Like Germany. Yeah. Um, yes. To put in some time. Yep. Shall I read the quote on page uh, seventy six? Please. Here? Yes. And then the higher education really began, but there was no question of going straight to philosophy for ten more years. This would be from ages twenty to thirty. Mm -hmm. The student went on with the various sciences, but at a higher level. So that by developing a wider viewpoint, by coordinating and combining the various branches. The mind gradually developed the faculty to detect the unity behind their mutual relationships, the nature of the fundamental reality from which they all derived. Right. Ten more years. Yeah. Right. It's like a med school, but without their Mercedes. Exactly. And my sense from for Plato, this again would be an elite few, where for the vast majority of people, once you're done with your secondary, you finish your military conscription, and now you you enter you know public life, you know, yeah. as as most people would. But yeah, ten more years, and then I, I, this idea of that part of that those 10 years is, is yes, doing more math and, and, and such, but also trying to kind of see how everything is connected yeah. together, how, how you connect the dots between all of these things you've been learning. The whole uh, ball of spaghetti. Yes. Right? What about age 50? What happens then? And this, I, I like this Because that's where we are. That's where right? we are. So you said at, at age 50, uh, one might finally have the necessary foundation to, um, uh, you, you struggled with, you've, you've kind of getting past all the temptations of, 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 of contemporary life. And then you might be ready to start the contemplation of pure goodness. Now, I have a problem with this a little bit. Okay. Because even though this seems like it may be true, if I remember from Aristotle, age 49 is a man's intellectual peak. Oh, is that, is that what Aristotle right. says? Right. So okay. then you start going down the other side, right? Yeah, right. So you will be as smart at age uh, 58 as you were at 40. And by the time you're quite old, you're, you know, you're back to infancy. Ah, yeah. So if you can't contemplate the good until you're 50, that's a year after your intellectual peak. Yeah. You have the downward slope for the contemplation of pure goodness. According to Aristotle, maybe right. Aristotle should have followed uh, you know Plato's uh, you okay. know, diet and hygiene regimen. I suppose. Kind of to keep it sharp, right? You're saying that Aristotle was on that metro car from uh, Syntagma to the Piraeus? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on a sweaty Sunday afternoon in January. <laughs> that could have been him. Oh, man. Oh, <laughs> right. man. Right. And so we, we kind of end up where we started. Okay. And so it, to what degree was this um, actually practiced? To what degree is this it was an ideal? I mean, Plato comes around uh, to the ideas that, uh, this notion that he maybe tried these ideas in Sicily and failed. 
Um, and he comes around saying that, well, maybe this kind of education isn't for organize, organizing the actual city, but organizing the, in his phrase, the city within you. Yeah. And like, like you were saying, is, is, uh, is the Republic actually about a Republic or is it about the architecture of the soul? Mm. Right. Do you want to read that final quote yes. that we have there? Uh, beginning with, uh, in the end, uh, yes. Plato perceived. I think this is page 78 of that, Marcou. That is correct. So he writes, in the end, Plato perceived, perceived the truth about his own nature. His teaching became concerned with one man only, or at most, a small group of men gathered together in a school, a closed sect, a cultural oasis in the midst of a war, of a, sorry, in the midst of a vast social de- desert. The wise man shall spend his life cultivating his own garden. The wise man for Platonism had now achieved a personalist type of wisdom. Thus Plato's thought set in motion the first instance by uh, the desire to reinstate the totalitarian ethic of the ancient city finally rises far above it and lays the foundations of what will remain the personal culture of the classical philosopher. Hmm. That's fascinating. That is really interesting. As a way to end, because you think of such persons as Seneca. Yeah. Right? Seneca had read his Plato, I mean, deeply and well. Mm -hmm. Seneca is trying to contribute to the governance of the Roman state, you know, uh, trying to govern through Nero. Yeah. But in the end, he commits suicide because he's uh, implicated in a conspiracy, and the only way he can rise above it is to claim the superiority of philosophy to all human affairs. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So he's, he's kind of living the Platonic ideal. Right, right, uh, right, right. In slow-mo. Yeah. It'd be, it'd be, it'd be, it'd be, I would love to know, you know if, uh, if, if Plato could have lived another you know, two, three hundred, four hundred years, yeah. but what he himself would have thought of, of kind of where his ideas went and, and, and in how he, they end up shaping um, education. I think he'd be shocked by the success of his ideas and pleased as anybody would be. Yeah. But also displeased and surprised in some ways. Yeah. Because his ideas went in directions he would not have liked. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, Dave, we're up against it. We got to get out of here. Yes, we do. We do. And before we go... Uh, is there any particular reason we have to get out of here? Uh, is there somebody knocking at the door? Not that you? I hear. No. It's, not this week. It's pretty quiet. Okay. There. Exactly. Um, but before we go, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the Moss Method and LLPSI. Would I you? would love to. So Moss Method for Greek is a program I've developed to teach you the Greek language. Go to mossmethod.com. It's a great value. Check it out. Excellent. And LLPSI, if yes. you want to study Latin? That's right. Go yeah. to latinperdiem.com slash LLPSI, and you can learn Latin with me using the Hans Orberg Lingua Latina Per Se Illustrata textbook. It's a good value. Jeff, Yes. we got to thank some people. Yep, we got to thank Mishka, our wonderful engineer, um, Ken and Scott, for the great music you hear yes. throughout, the, the, throughout the episode. And if you want to get a t-shirt or some other merch, go to adnauseum.com, get a Quinocent Dokent t-shirt. Jeff, yep. what is on tap for next week? I, I think let's continue this, Maru. All right. Let's, let's, let's dive into chapter seven. Which is Isocrates, okay. one, of, one of Plato's competitors. Yes, sounds, excellent. Sounds exciting. And Dave, you have our gustatory parting shot. Yes, I do. This is from someone, a French guy, Francois de la Rochefoucauld. Ooh. It's the best I can do. Not bad. He, uh, 1613 to 1680, I don't know, some crazy French moralist <laughs> philosopher writing kind of guy. Okay. And this is what he said. I don't understand it. To eat is a necessity. But to eat intelligently is an art. Okay. Well, what do you think, Jeff? I have to contemplate that. All right. You think about it. We'll see you next week. See ya.